the gate valve uh, between, um, between the chamber and the pump so you can control the pressure. And for ICP etching, that pressure is usually between about two millitor and 50 millitor. Uh, an RF field can be applied to the table, so a bias put across the table. Uh, and this is called the RF or the bias power and uh, controls the iron energy. At the top of the chamber, there is an ICP coil. So there's a coil going around here and a second RF field can be applied to the top of the chamber um, through this coil. And this is called inductively coupled plasma or ICP power. And although uh, most um, systems, ICP systems do have ICP and this RF or bias power, we tend just to call them ICP systems. Um, and these two RF fields can be controlled independently, which allows for independent control of iron energy through the bias power and iron density through the ICP power. And just on the right, you have an image of um, one of Oxford Instruments sort of most common ICP systems, the Plasma Pro 100, Cobra 300. And this example has a load lock, so you can load a single wafer into the chamber at a time. Um, we do have uh, systems which have handlers, so you can um, put a cassette in a load lock and then a robot will uh, load those wafers one by one. So we can achieve what we're trying to achieve when we're using this ICP etching. Well, we can achieve a range of profiles using plasma etching. This is from an undercut profile where the etch rate is the same or very similar in all directions uh, called isotropic etching. And this is similar to the profile you get when doing a wet etch. But the advantage of um, ICP etching or plasma etching over wet etching is we can also get sloped or vertical profiles where the downwards etching is faster than the lateral etching. And this is generally called anisotropic etching. Although I don't have an image here, we can even get re-entry profiles where the angle is greater than 90 degrees, but is um, relatively straight. So it's undercut, but not this uh, scooped or sort of um, C-shaped profile you get with isotropic etching. And what about surface quality? Well, we generally want a smooth surface like on the images here on the left and on the other slides, but we can also produce rough surfaces or surfaces with grass-like needles. In fact, these, um, this roughness or needles can be quite difficult to get rid of when we don't want them. Um, and they can be difficult to get just right or just in the confirmation or sort of density that you want them. Um, which is which you occasionally do, such as when you're producing black silicon for photovoltaic type applications. And different devices require different structures. So what characteristics are we looking for when etching three, five materials for particular devices? Well, we've got some examples here. So for devices such as uh, laser diodes, LEDs, or uh, array waveguide gratings, we want a uh, vertical profile with a smooth etch surface. For photodiodes, again, smooth etch surface and either a vertical or a slope profile, depending on the design required for that particular diode. For hemp, FETs and other power devices, smooth, smooth surface, but we want this isotropic, very undercut profile. Micro lenses, they're a sort of slightly special case because you're trying to transfer the lens shape you've created in your photoresist mask down into your substrate. So you're trying to create a process that has a, an approximately one-to-one -one selectivity between the photoresist mask and the etching substrate. And finally, Vixels. So they're a type of laser, um, usually etched out of gallium arsenide type materials. And again, we need a smooth surface, a vertical or slope profile, and low footing. So I'll talk a little bit more about footing later, but basically it's this angle in the corner uh, needs to be as sort of sharp as possible. You don't want any curve in there. It's often called like bathtub corners because if you imagine um, like a bathtub coming around at the bottom, you don't want that. You want a nice um, sharp angle. And uh, first I'm going to talk about Indian phosphide etching. So Indian phosphide can be wet etched using a variety of different solutions, uh, wet etching solutions. However, wet etching does have its disadvantages such as you always get this isotropic undercut profile. There uh, can be poor cross, across wafer uniformity and also poor uh, wafer to wafer repeatability. The first plasma etchers uh, of Indian phosphide were using RAE only and a methane hydrogen chemistry. 
And the advantage of using plasma is you can get an anisotropic profile, uh, very good in wafer uniformity and wafer to wafer repeatability. And then ICP etching was adopted for Indian phosphide chemistry, um, initially based on the original methane hydrogen chemistry, but methane hydrogen is very dirty. It forms a lot of polymer during the post process, which will coat your chamber and your wafer. And so you have lots of extra cleaning steps necessary, both for the wafer and for your um, etching chamber. And then there were processes introduced that contain chlorine. Um, and these allow for processes with, um, they have lower or in fact, even in, in one case, no polymer, and they have much higher et traits than the original methane hydrogen chemistry. And I'm going to talk about two of these chlorine containing processes today. So these are methane chlorine hydrogen and chlorine argon, and they both have their advantages and disadvantages. The methane hydrogen chlorine process is the most widely used today. It has, it's a very well established process used by lots of production companies. It has a very wide process window, so you can get um, you can get the exact etch you want depending on the profile or the etch rate or the surface quality or after. And it, you can produce very smooth surfaces and side walls. And the etch rate is relatively high at above uh, 750 nanometers a minute for a three inch wafer. Uh, the, uh, the chlorine argon process, well, the methane chlorine hydrogen process does have its disadvantages as well. It does still contain methane and hydrogen. It can form a lot of polymer which uh, will you know, stick on your surfaces, your side walls, make your chamber dirty much more quickly. Uh, and it also contains hydrogen. And hydrogen uh, can diffuse into your material and change its electronic properties. The, the chlorine argon process is the main alternative to methane chlorine hydrogen. It has the advantages, it's polymer free, it's very, very clean. Um, and I'll show you some marathon data later, um, which will confirm this and also it's hydrogen free. There are no danger of electronic changes to your substrate. Still got a relatively high etch rate, greater than 500 nanometers a minute and can produce smooth surfaces and smooth side walls. I'm gonna start talking about this uh, chlorine argon process. Uh, and as we go through today, I'm going to be using a waveguide type etch uh, as an example. So what do waveguides require? Well, a vertical profile, no undercutting or notching at the top of the mask, so no sort of mouse bites or roughness up the top here. Smooth etch surfaces and side walls, and also low footing and low trenching as far as possible. So yeah, footing is this curve in the bottom here. Ideally, you want a nice straight, um, and in the case of a vertical profile, 90 degree side wall. And trenching um, it is this little sort of notch that can form at the bottom of the side walls. Again, you want to try and avoid this as much as possible. And so what parameters do we need to consider when trying to create this perfect wave by etch? Well, firstly, I'm going to talk a lot about etching and passivation gases, and they are the main factor in getting a good profile when etching 3.5 materials. So uh, just using a non 3.5 example that you might have come across, when etching silicon, um, the etching gas is SF6. So in the plasma, this breaks down to form fluorine radicals, which react with the silicon, forming silicon fluoride, which is very volatile, will leave the surface, and therefore you get etching. But if you only have that etching gas, you'd end up with this very isotropic undercut profile, which isn't what we're after. So uh, we also introduce a passivation gas. In the case of silicon, this tends to be C4F8. It'll form a polymer, which will deposit on the surface, deposit on the side walls, protect it and allow you to get the vertical or even slope profile that you're after. Uh, I'm also going to talk about temperature, uh, pressure, and the effects of ICP and RAE power. And so I said I'd mentioned temperature, and that's a very good place to start when understanding the etching of indium phosphide. So all three five elements, they're very reactive with chlorine forming chlorine. And from the table, you can see under the conditions we're using, most of these chlorides are relatively volatile, all except for indium chloride, which is much less volatile than the others. So that's 250 degrees compared to the others, which are mostly under 100 degrees. Um, and so we need high temperatures to ensure this indium chloride reforming leaves the surface and allows some etching. Uh, so for the chlorine argon process, it's run at a high temperature with table temperatures of above about 190 degrees C. 
This process is also unclamped and unbonded. So the pieces or the wafer are just placed on a carrier, uh, which is then clamped to the table, but isn't actively cooled. So the temperature of the piece or the wafer will be much higher due to plasma heating. And so I've mentioned etching and passivation gases. So what are the etching and passivation gases in, in chlorine argon? Slightly confusingly, chlorine is acting as both the main etching gas and the main passivation gas. And therefore we must find a temperature balance where the temperature is high enough for some indium chloride to leave the surface and etching to occur, but low enough for some indium chloride to remain on the surface, protect the side walls and give this vertical profile we're, we're after. So I've got an example here, uh, temperature increases going clockwise from top left. Uh, top left, the temperature is too low. We've got a rough surface and very sloped side walls. Top right, temperatures increase slightly. We've got an improved surface, but the profile is still slightly positive. Uh, bottom right, slightly higher temperature again, smooth surface, nice vertical side walls. This is the, the waveguide etch we're after. This is the, the, the characteristics we want. And then if we continue on to the bottom left, we've gone to temperatures that are too high. The indium chloride is too volatile. Um, and we'll leave the surface um, you know, too, too easily and we'll get this isotropic undercut etching. And it's a chlorine argon process. So the argon is mainly present to dilute the chlorine, allowing more control of the process because chlorine is very reactive with indium phosphide. And it also provides a, a physical sputtering element to the etch to help remove some of that indium chloride from the surface, especially from the sort of surface in, in the field out here whereas it, it allows it to remain on the side walls here and protect them. Another important factor is pressure. So at low pressures, the ions have a long mean poo path. They're not hitting into each other very much. They're not being deflected. And so they'll come down onto the surface at a relatively perpendicular. Uh, this means the etching will be vertical. You'll have good CD control, so critical dimension control. That pattern you've spent ages uh, forming very nice in your mouth will be transferred directly vertically down into your substrate. Um, uh, but because you've got sort of lower iron density, you'll have lower etch rates and also lower selectivity. At high pressures, there is a higher density of ions and other species in the plasma. They're all banging into each other, low mean through path, they're being deflected. And so when they come down onto the surface, they'll do so at a more oblique angle. This means the etch rate will be much higher because you've got a high density of ions hitting the surface, but the profile will also be undercut slightly. And the selectivity does tend to be slightly higher. And next, let's consider what happens when you change the ICP and RAE powers. So if you, we've got some examples here uh, as I go through. Uh, as you increase ICP power, you're increasing the iron density in the plasma the process becomes more chemical, there are more ions to react with the surface, and therefore the etch rate will get higher, um, but you will get more undercutting of the mass, so you'll get a more undercut isotropic type profile. If you increase RE power, you're increasing the iron energy, you're getting a more physical etch, so um, the ions are hitting the surface with higher energy, um, and they will be coming down as they increase with energy with a small vertical profile, You'll get a higher rate uh, and a more vertical profile, but you will reduce the selectivity due to the um, increased iron bomb on the mask. And so here is an example where we've optimized temperature, gas flow, pressures, and powers, and have got a really nice process we could use for a waveguide etch. Uh, it's a high temperature process, obviously, because you've got indium chloride forming, you need to allow it to leave the surface. Um, to make sure it's smooth and it etches. You've got a high etch rate, greater than 500 nanometers a minute. Um, it's also damage free so you, and hydrogen free, so you shouldn't get any electronic um, changes to your, your structure. Uh, and it's worth noting that this is a high temperature process, so we must use a silicon dioxide or silicon nitride mask because a photoresist mask would just burn you'd get really nasty rough side walls from that rough mask, and you'd also end up with a very burnt on baked PR mask, which is almost impossible to remove. And just as a uh, contrast, what happens if we etch at very high temperatures using only chlorine? So this is much higher temperatures, above 250 degrees, um, and you get a very isotropic profile. 
So the wafer is well above the temperature where indium chloride volatilizes. This means there's lots of etching, there's no passivation, and you get this very undercut isotropic profile. And it's worth noting a much higher etch rate. So this is etch rates of over a micron a minute compared to over 500 nanometers a minute in the last, uh, in the last example. Uh, and as I said, I'd show a marathon process. So um, to show how clean this process is, we ran a marathon. And this is where we run multiple wafers, one after another, just like a, a customer would do in a production facility. And here we've run 500 microns of indium phosphate etching without any change in the etch rate, which we can see top left here. So we have a very good steady etch rate and no increase in particles, as you can see bottom right here. Now, we did have to end the marathon after running 500 microns of indium phosphide, but this wasn't because we got increased particles or any change in the results. It's just we reached the end of the planned marathon and we'd run out of time. So it is a very clean process where you can etch over 500 um, microns of indium phosphide before you even need to think about cleaning the chamber. Now on to the methane chlorine hydrogen process, which does have lots of advantages. It's the most widely used technique most widely used technique today for etching in the phosphide, and it is a very sort of robust process with this very wide process window. Uh, and back to uh, indium phosphide and temperature. So we've already talked about 3,5 chlorides, and they're generally very volatile, except for this indium fluoride, which has much, uh, which is volatile at much higher temperatures. So 3,5 elements also react really easily with uh, the hydrogen in methane and hydrogen uh, forming hydrides. And as you can see from this table on the left, they're even more volatile than chlorides. They form and leave the surface immediately. Um, and the methane chlorine hydrogen process is run at a much lower temperature than the chlorine argon process. So you've got electrode temperatures of between 70 and 100 degrees C. The, the wafers are still unclamped, so they will be being heated by the plasma um, and they will be hotter than the electrode temperature, but still much lower than in the chlorine argon process. Therefore, at this low temperature, the indium chloride produced won't be very volatile. So chlorine is acting as a passivation gas and the methane and hydrogen are forming these very volatile hydrides and they're actually acting as the etching gases. So for example, at the bottom here, uh, bottom left, we have um, a process with relatively low chlorine flow, flow, we're getting an undercut profile. And as we go across, we increase the amount of chlorine flow, get a more vertical profile until we've got lots of chlorine and you're starting to get this anisotropic and even slightly sloped profile. And so to get the profile you want when you're etching methane chlorine hydrogen, you need to consider the balance between the etching gas gases, which are methane and hydrogen, and the passivation gas, which is chlorine. Uh, the other parameters um, for etching uh, indium phosphide with methane chlorine hydrogen are very similar to those as for chlorine argon, so I'm not going to go through those trends again. And here we have an example of a methane chlorine hydrogen waveguide etch. Um, it produces results relatively similar to that of the chlorine argon. You get smooth sidewall, slightly higher etch rate, uh, greater than 750 microns a minute on a three inch wafer. And it does have this advantage that it's a very stable um, process with a wide process window, low device damage, and you can form either vertical profiles like the one you'd want for the waveguide shown here, or slope profiles. So in this case, we've got a profile about 70 degrees C, and the profile can be achieved in two different ways, either by increasing the amount of passivation in the plasma. Uh, sorry, it, it's, it is created in two ways. The first uh, is increasing the amount of passivation in the plasma. The, um, so you put up, in this case, the amount of chlorine. The etch rate is slightly lower here than for the uh, vertical process. So the vertical process is about 750 nanometers a minute. And here we're looking at something in the range of about 500 nanometers a minute. And this is due to this increased amount of passivation in the plasma necessary to form the slope. The other way the slope is required is using a sloped mask. So a slope profile needs a slope mask. And this is also a lower selectivity process. So you're using the etching of the mask to 
pull it back slightly from the, the top of those side walls, and that pullback will allow the profile of the etch you're creating to follow the profile of the mask. And similar to the chlorine argon process, we've run a marathon here. So for the methane chlorine argon process, hydrogen process rather, we had to, we were able to run about 240 microns of indium phosphide before we needed to mechanically clean the chamber. And this was due to the increasing number of particles, which shows how much dirtier process with more polymer and more particles forming than the chlorine argon process. And you can see these, these red lines are, are, are where we had to open and mechanically clean the chamber. And as you can see, the number of particles were beginning to, uh, the number of particles were beginning to increase. And so we had to stop, clean the chamber. Um, and then we demonstrated we could start running the process again uh, with very similar uh, results. So cleaning the chamber didn't change the etch, but was necessary from a particle point of view. Uh, and next I'm going to talk about gallium arsenide etching and in particular the etching of pixels and back to temperature. So gallium and arsenic chlorides um, form very easily and they're very volatile at room temperature. So the challenge with etching uh, gallium arsenide as compared to indium phosphide is getting this smooth vertical slope profile as you want with no lateral isotropic etching and being able to control the process. So uh, ensuring it doesn't go too fast for the, the depth you're trying to achieve. So here the samples are clamped and they're actively cooled to keep the temperature low and under control. Um, and other than the difference in temperature, the other trends, so power, pressure, um, are very similar to that of indium phosphide. So I'm not going to go through those again. And here's an example of a process uh, for etching gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide using BCL3 chlorine-based chemistry. So the etching gases here are the chlorine-based, so BCL3 and chlorine, and the nitrogen acts as a passivant, reacting with the side walls, allowing um, some protection, which allows you to get this nice vertical profile we're after. Argon uh, can be included, and it basically increases the sputtering component of the plasma, and makes the etch a little more physical, which can help getting a vertical profile. It also acts as a dilutant to the etching gases, which allows you to have that increased control. And you might have noticed here, the etch rates for etching gallium arsenide are a lot higher than those for indium phosphide. So we're looking at rates of up to about one and a half microns a minute. And this is due to this increased volatility of gallium arsenide with the uh, chlorine, um, of the increased volatility of gallium and arsenic chlorides. We can also do a similar process using a silicon tetrachloride chlorine-based chemistry, also with nitrogen passivation. This is often used to produce uh, pillars or nanowires, as shown here. And we can take this um, approach to you know, extremes, producing very high aspect ratio structures, such as this work that was done at Sun Yat-sen University. And moving on to VIXELs. So what are VIXELs? VIXEL stands for Vertical Cavity Surface Emitting Laser. And they're a type of laser that's increasingly being used now in 3D sensing, such as facial recognition in smartphones. And this is a clip from a patent uh, by Apple, which is a, a random or a pseudo random VIXEL array, which is used for facial recognition in iPhones. VIXELs are also used for optical data communication in data centers. And as um, data centers and our use of data increases, their use um, in, in sort of information transfer is only going to uh, increase. It's also worth remembering that VIXELs have been used for many years in more sort of low tech devices, uh, such as laser computer mice. And so what's the structure of a VIXEL? We have a nice diagram on the right here. So a VIXEL is formed by layers of two DBR mirrors, which are stacks of thin layers of uh, gallium arsenide and aluminium gallium arsenide. These mirrors, they're above and below an active region, which, uh, or, or laser cavity, so this is where the laser light is produced. And this active region is defined using layers which are very rich in aluminum oxide. And the advantages of pixels over edge emitting lasers are that they can be test, one of the biggest ones is they can be tested on wafer. So um, as pixels are surface emitting, essentially what that means is the laser light is coming out perpendicular. So it's coming out 90 degrees to the plane uh, 
of the wafer you're making it out of. This means that as the Vixel, as the wafer goes through the process, they can test the lasing of the, the individual Vixel Mesa as you go through. This means that you can obviously scrap wafers that have got defects much, much earlier in the process. Whereas with edge admitting lasers, you need to um, you need to get to the end, you've got you've diced your wafer, you've packaged it before you can really test the lasers. And it can be very expensive if then it turns out that an entire wafer uh, went wrong somewhere early in the process and you've just had to go through the entire process for a product that doesn't work. Other advantages of Vixels is you can form 2D arrays with them on the surface of these wafers. Um, they produce a much more circular and lower divergent beam than edge emitting lasers. They have lower threshold current and lower power consumption, so they're much cheaper to run. And, and this can be very important in, you know, such as large data centers where you're going to have, you know, millions or of these things all working at the same time. They have a, a lower temperature sensitivity, so they can work, they will work efficiently over um, a wider range of temperatures than edge emitting lasers. And this can be important in things like, for example, LIDAR in cars, where you need to know your laser will work both on a you know, hot summer's day and a very cold winter's day. It's also possible to tune the uh, output wavelength of Vixels. So you could have a Vixel which swept over a, a range of wavelengths, for example, for um, chemical sensing. And in general, they are cheaper to produce, cheaper to package and cheaper to run than conventional lasers. And so um, if, we, if we want to form a MESA or a, a structure to make a Vixel, how does the geometry of that MESA affect the function of the final device? Well, we need to ensure precise MESA diameter so we get uh, a good power conversion efficiency, low threshold current, a really good beam quality, and um, good mode polarization. You need to have an accurate profile because this helps define the uniformity of the electric field inside the MESA. And also um, it can help with efficient device isolation when you go on to and move on to the next steps of forming your Vixel. You need accurate MESA height. So this prevents blocking of um, electron injection into the active region. And also um, it can prevent damage to the active region. So if you um, etched sort of below the active region, you need to make sure you're going down that far so you don't get any damage to it. Uh, also, we need to make sure we have a smooth and clean surface as this affects the serial resistance and the threshold current. So how do we ensure we achieve the shape of the MESA that we need to, to, make, to make, uh, make sure the end pixel is the best quality we have? Well, so precise MESA diameter, we need to make sure we have a good initial mask quality, and I'll talk more about masks in a minute. Low footing, so in one of these curving bathtub corners at the bottom, very high uniformity. Uh, so we know that the, the MESA in the center of our wafer looks exactly the same as the MESA at the edge of our wafer. You need, and you also need um, accurate profile control. How do we get accurate profile control? Well, this is through knowledge of the process and the gases that we use and how we balance those etching and passivation gases to obtain the profile that we want. Accurate MESA height. Um, high uniformity, so you know the, the MESA in the center of our wafer is exactly the same as the MESA on our edge, on the edge of our wafer, they're the same height. And also we can use endpointing techniques such as uh, OES and laser spectroscopy to ensure that we're uh, stopping on the same layer on every single wafer. So you're, so you're, getting, the, um, you're getting the same MESA on every single wafer that you process. And a smooth, clean surface, well, particularly on the side walls, this requires a selectivity of one one-to-one -one between gallium arsenide and aluminium gallium arsenide. And so you don't get sort of rippling as you go down the layers because one layer is faster than the next. And we can do this by carefully choosing the gas chemistry that we use. And here is a sort of fairly um, data heavy slide, but it's the specs for our vitro acting process. And I would like to highlight that we can achieve either a sloped or a vertical profile, depending on what we require for our MESA. And remember that we do this by balancing the etching and the passivation gases. And this particular process also has very low footing. Uh, for a vertical process, it's generally less than 3%. And for a sloped process, it can be essentially zero. You get a very nice sharp corner. And this low footing allows us to accurately etch uh, some 
of the new Vixel structures that have been required. So with no footing, no curve at the bottom, these features can be closer together without causing any in in electrical interference between each other. Um, and this is important in you know, structures such as we've got here with you know, very uh, narrow trenches or these are very close together. I'd also like to just uh, go back and think a little bit about that random array, which is being used in iPhones. So in a random array, there'll be different spacing between the mesas. So the gap, you know, sometimes you'll have mesas that are very close together, and sometimes you'll have a very large gap size with quite a wide open field. And so when you're trying to etch different gap sizes, smaller gaps tend to etch much slower than bigger gaps because gas can more easily get into larger features and it will take longer to diffuse into these smaller features. And this effect is called RAE lag. And this process we've developed has minimal RA lag, which allows uh, for our etching of these random arrays and all the fixal mesa will be very similar heights, which is important then in their um, ultimate lasing function. I'd also like to highlight, we can um, etch three, five materials, which are made out of sort of quaternary elements. So they contain other things like, um, uh, antimonide or um, arsenic in indium structures, for example. So this here, we've got uh, an indium arsenide and gallium antimonide based structure. So it has um, an indium arsenide gallium antimonide super lattice structure, and then both pure indium arsenide and gallium antimonide layers. And when we're looking at one of these quaternary structures, we need to think about the volatility of the elements to decide what process we're going to use. So in this case, the structure contains indium. So we're going to have to use a high temperature process to ensure that indium chloride is volatile. If we used a low temperature sort of gallium arsenide type process, the indium chloride would form, but it wouldn't be volatile. And we'd end up with a very slow profile and very rough side walls. So here we've used indium based processes uh, to develop um, a methane chlorine hydrogen slope process and also a chlorine argon vertical process. And it's worth noting that we've got no notching or change in profile as we go down uh, through the different layers. And again, this is important in the um, ultimate function of your, uh, of your device. Uh, and next, I'm just going to talk briefly about mask etching because masks are really important. If you don't have a good mask at the start of your etch, you'll never have a good, um, a good etch when you're finished. So first, it's important to ensure you have the correct mask for your process. So for indium phosphide processes, you're etching at high temperatures, and therefore you should use a hard mask, such as uh, silicon nitride or silicon dioxide. For gallium arsenide etches, you can use a photoresist mask or a hard mask. It doesn't really matter too much. Sometimes a hard mask can be better for getting a vertical profile, and a PR can be better for getting a slope profile. So if you have a less than optical mask, optimal mask, it can cause issues. So with profile, if you need to have a vertical mask, if you want to form a vertical profile or a slope mask or a slope profile. If you try and form a vertical profile with a slope mask, that mask can sort of pull back, etch back from the edge, and then you can get issues with um, surface roughness and breakdown at the top, of the, uh, the top of your edge. If you're trying to use a vertical mask to form a slope profile, you're just really gonna struggle to get, get a, you know, a profile that's as sloped as you probably want. There are also issues with uh, mask roughness. So if the edge of your mask is very rough, uh, that roughness will be transferred down onto the side of the etch uh, in the form of striations. So there's a very uh, extreme example here, but here you've got a very rough mask that I always think looks a bit like a coastline. And when we've etched it, it does transfer straight down into the substrate. And you can imagine if you had just like slight ripply roughness on the edge of your mask, you'd still get that transferred down. And at Oxford, we have an excellent ICP uh, silicon dioxide mask etch, which can be used to etch both slope and vertical mask profiles with high etch rates and good selectivity. The selectivity between um, the silicon dioxide and the PR mask is good, but also is important between the silicon dioxide and the underlying 3,5 substrate, because otherwise you'll get over etching into the substrate and then that can go on to affect the further etching you, that you do. You can also use endpointing such as OES or laser to um, ensure that you have you stop as soon as you reach the uh, 3,5 substrate. 
And here we have an example of a silicon dioxide etch. So this is silicon dioxide and you've got the photoresist on top, uh, relatively vertical side walls above 88 degrees. And then on the left, we just have some examples of the indium phosphide etch um, done using this mask. And we've got a nice vertical side wall and no roughness, breakdown, striations on the edge. And very quickly, I'd like to just go through some uh, troubleshooting issues that uh, you could face if you ever try and etch your own through five materials. So one of the biggest ones I tend to come across is roughness or needles on the surface. Um, with roughness, it tends to be, you tend to be etching in your phosphide if you get roughness that looks like the top left here, and this is temperature. Your indium chloride isn't volatile enough, you just need to stick the temperature up um, and try again. You can also get little like uh, needles or brass like this all over the surface. And this happens on both indium phosphide and gallium arsenide. And this tends to be from micro masking. So if, you're, if you have any surface residue left in your mask or any dirt on the surface that can cause micro masking. Also, if you're using a metal mask, which we tend not to recommend because it sputters. So it will, um, so metal will be knocked off your mask during your process. It'll settle on the surface and cause micro masking like this and needles. The next issue is rough side walls. So in general, this comes from your mask quality. So improve your mask quality so you, you, it doesn't have a rough edge. So you, and this will reduce the striations, the, these sort of lines running down the side of your edge. And also think about your mask profile. If you've got a slope mask and you're trying to get a vertical etch, the mask will etch back, it'll pull back from the surface, leaving it unprotected and you get this breakdown and roughness at the top. Profile, um, if you're not getting the profile you want, the first thing to do is to consider the balance between passivation and etching species. Uh, if you're etching in your phosphide, temperature can also be an issue if it's too sloped. Uh, and you're after a vertical profile, putting the temperature up can help, just helping volatilize that indium chloride so you have less passivation. And also think about the initial mask profile. Remember, vertical profile, vertical mask, slope profile, slope mask. And the final one I want to mention is micro trenching. And this is the one that's perhaps hardest to get rid of. So it's caused by ions being directed into the corner by etching, usually by charging up of the side wall or the mask. And the ways you can try and reduce it are reducing the gas flow and also lowering the pressure of your etch to try and sort of increase the energy of those ions and um, encourage them to come down to the surface uh, in a more vertical manner. So today I've talked about producing high quality 3-5 etches, starting off with a quick summary of ICP etching uh, and what the devices we're trying to produce are. Then I've mentioned the etching of methane, uh, chlorine, hydrogen and chlorine argon. Um, sorry, the etching of indium phosphide using methane, chlorine, hydrogen, and chlorine argon, and then the etching of gallium arsenide, particularly uh, of pixels. And then I've also talked a little bit about the importance of getting your mask right and how to troubleshoot a process. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, are there any questions? Uh, okay, thank you, Dr. Katie, for a wonderful talk on the uh, deep RI and RI etching process of group three and five elements, and it gives a deep understanding how to optimize the device parameter mm -hmm. by playing these parameters. So now we are moving to the query sessions. We have a couple of questions. So first question is, uh, how to ensure which type of gas combination required for sharp vertical and isotropic etching? And uh, how to get deep etching of silicon, let's say 100 micron, will it be possible in a normal tools or need some higher order tools? Sorry, sorry, can you just repeat the question? I was trying to work out how to stop sharing. Uh, okay, okay, I'm repeating the sorry. questions. Uh, apologies. So how to ensure which type of gas combination required for sharp vertical and isotropic etching? And second question is uh, in continuation, how to get deep etching of silicon, let's say, 100 micron, will it be possible in normal tools or need other advanced tools? Okay, um, so yes, yeah, so ensuring the gas combination. So this is just, uh, you just need to consider what's happening in your plasma. So this, it's um, this balance between passivation gas and etching gas. So what, what are you etching? What, what, what gases are etching your material and what gases are passivating your material? So if you want a vertical etch, you need to make sure you have enough passivation to protect that side wall. 
but without having too much so you get sloped. For isotropic etching, drop the passivation out. You just want your etching gases so you get the undercut. Uh, deep etching of silicon, yes, you can do it in a normal tool, um, but it kind of depends on how, uh, how good you want that etch to be. So if you want an etch which is very high aspect ratio or has very high scallops down the edges, um, you will need a sort of a, a specialist Bosch tool with specialist MFCs and fast switching and um, better control. If you just want a sort of a, a relatively deep hole, which is very wide in silicon, you can probably achieve that in a standard ICP tool. Okay. Um, moving to next question. How to get perfectly trench as you sewed? <laughs> well, you just need to, uh, well, consider, consider all the factors that I've talked about and um, balance them. So it's, it's very hard to say you have to use this param these parameters and you use those parameters and you know, the first shot, the first thing you etch is perfect. You need to do an etch, you need to consider what you need to change, think about how passivation and etching are affecting that. Is the pressure, the, is the pressure right? Are the powers right? And do a series of experiments with iterations to um, you know, perfect your etch. Um, because it, because you know, an etch depends on so many things. It depends on your chamber, on your mask, on your material, um, and on exactly what you achieve. Uh, okay, so uh, I I have a doubt. Is it intensely uh, etch out uh, as a trench shape, or is it's happening during the etching process? Sorry, is the it's intensely this structure is uh, etched out to make the trench shape side by the waveguide or it's happening during the etching of waveguide? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't really get what the question was there. Apologies. Uh, okay, so moving no, to the next question. So uh, what is the effect of bias power in etching process? Yeah, so bias, I mean, if you increase the bias power, so the bias power is affecting the um, iron energy. So you put up the bias, you increase the iron energy and you get um, your irons are coming down onto your surface more vertically. So you'll get a more vertical profile, you'll get a higher etch rate, but also you're going to get more sputtering and that a sputtering is going to affect the etching rate of the mask, which will increase. So you'll also decrease your selectivity. Uh, okay, hope this answered. Uh, next question in condition, we have a couple of more questions. So we'll take two more questions and we'll move to the next talk. So, uh, next question is, uh, have you tested etching of TMDC material, uh, 2D material like MOS2, WSA2 thin layer? Yep, we have done that at Oxford Instruments. Um, it's not my speciality, but if you, um, if you would like to know more, you can contact through the um, Oxford Instruments website and we can put you in touch with our 2D um, material specialists. Okay. Uh, Next question, how do you optimize selectivity of resist material with respect to indium phosphide or other uh, three, four material, three, five materials? Generally, uh, resist doesn't sustain long enough and under layer material start etching that gives the overage device pattern. How do you control or play with the RI parameters? Yeah, so this is something you can so definitely consider when you make your mask. Um, is to make sure it's thick enough for what you want to do. But if you if you have a mask, you know, you already have a mask and you're trying to etch deeper, um, there are things you can do. So uh, firstly, the thing is to do things that will protect your mask. And this tends to be things like reducing the RIE power, um, putting up the pressure. Uh, so essentially doing things that slow the etching rate of your mask. Now these can also slow the etching rate of your uh, substrate. So you do need to consider that. And the other thing you consider is how do I increase the etching rate of my substrate without increasing the etching rate of my mask? So these can be things like increasing ICP power uh, and putting up the temperature. So there's sort of two approaches you can use and you can push it a bit further, but there will be a point where you'll just need to get a better mask or a thicker mask 
or if you're using a photoresist mask, perhaps removing, moving to an oxide or nitride mask. Okay, I hope this answers. So moving to last question. So uh, last question is, I have a chrome hard mask on the amorphous silicon. So I then do ICPRI with CF4 chemistry to edge the SM, uh, amorphous silicon. Now I want to remove chromium using chromium agent, but due to polymer residue from ICPRI, chromium is not being etched properly. Do you have any suggestion for this? Um, yes, you could try an oxygen plasma at the end of your silicon etch. So after you've etched your silicon, try um, maybe a minute or two of oxygen plasma just to try and remove any of that polymer or residue from the surface. Um, I think, yeah, using CHF3, you should be producing a polymer that can be etched off using oxygen. So I give that a go. Okay, so one more interesting question is uh, more about the carrier. So question is that this is a carrier question. So please feel free to ignore this if you don't want to comfortable addressing this one on the forum. Katie, can you comment on your journey from academia to industry as a PhD student about to graduate? I'm looking at a, my option. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Um, so I actually did my PhD on a slightly different subject. Um, it was still chemistry, but it was uh, hydrogen storage materials. So I was doing a lot of sort of materials type chemistry and some um, diffraction. So once I finished my PhD, I knew I wanted to stay in science, but I didn't really want to stay in academia and I wasn't sure I wanted to stay in the same subject. So partly I didn't necessarily see hydrogen storage as a particularly growth sector at the time. I think at the time everyone was looking at batteries for future energy and therefore there weren't many companies looking at hydrogen. And also I just wasn't sure I was enjoying it anymore. So I, my approach was I just applied for lots of jobs, anything that looked interesting. I read a lot about the science of the things I was applying for. I went to interviews with a very open mind. So, and I was lucky and the Oxford Instruments offered me a job and it was something that was very interesting and I'm still very interested in. And it turned out I was uh, at least a little bit good at. So um, I think my advice would be think about what you want and apply for lots of jobs because it's a very good way of learning what's out there. And um, even though I know that preparing for interviews and sending out cover letters and doing the applications can be a little bit depressing and you know, getting the reply that someone else was hired can be very depressing. It's a good way of looking at what your options are and will keep you busy while you're trying to decide what you're doing next. Uh, okay. So now we'll move to the next talk. So let's thank the speaker, Dr. Katie Hori, for a wonderful talk on the RI etching of group three and five elements. Great, thank moving you. To the, thank you. Now moving to the next speaker, Dr. Thomas, to the next talk. So now I hand over the reins to Dr. Thomas to share the screen and start the talk. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me um, okay? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you and the screen is on full screen mode. Okay, okay you can perfect, proceed. perfect. So thank you, Katie, for that uh, amazing talk on, on etching. Um, so, so my talk is slightly different in the fact that it's, it's not etching, it's deposition. Um, my name is Owen Thomas. I've been with Oxford Instruments more than 15 years, uh, worked for over more than 20 years in the, the, the industry, mostly around deposition as a whole. Um, uh, and I hold a position in Oxford Instruments at the moment as the commercial solutions manager um, that looks after a lot of the interaction that we have with customers um, and also uh, around the processes that we offer to customers. Um, so today, um, I'm going to uh, give you a, a little bit of introduction and a brief overview of deposition, various deposition techniques um, and then concentrate uh, then on two two main techniques that we offer at Oxford Instruments to deposit thin films. One being plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition, i.e. PCVD, and inductively coupled plasma chemical vapor deposition, ICP-CVD. Um, I'll be explaining a little bit about the hardware uh, that we offer as to, to uh, produce uh, films with these techniques. 
and also some of the processes that we can deposit uh, using these techniques, such as uh, dielectric films, such as silicon oxide and silicon nitride. Also, additional materials uh, that we have developed um, using these techniques. And then a little bit of um, information around plasma cleaning, because obviously in deposition reactors, you deposit the film. It not only goes on the substrate, but also in the reactor itself. So you need ways of cleaning the chamber um, and maintain a good um, performance of the chamber for the next deposition. And then a quick summary and conclusion um, of, of the talk. Yeah. So if we start with a, a basic introduction of plasma deposition, now deposited films um, are widely used in the fabrication of um, VLSI circuits and photonic devices. Um, they provide various uses ranging from conducting regions within a device, um, insulating layers between metals, um, light manipulation and propagation layers, and, and then production, uh, protection for, from the environment. Um, we also refer to the layers as thin film. Obviously, this is a relative term and can, and can mean a um, range of thicknesses in terms of whether it's uh, atom layers um, uh, or a few tens of nanometers into sort of several microns of deposition. So the deposition usually uh, falls into two broad categories, um, one being chemical, um, which is chemical, one, one within chemical is chemical vapor deposition, um, and others are chemical solution and plating. Uh, and the flip side of that is the physical deposition, where, where it's more evaporation, sputtering, laser deposition, and cathodic arc deposition. And then you can have some, which is a combination of both, which is chemical and physical, which is reactive sputtering and molecular, molecular beam epitaxy. Today, I'm going to concentrate more on the chemical side of, of the technique, which is um, mostly around chemical vapor deposition. And within um, chemical vapor deposition, there are a number of CVD or chemical vapor deposition processes, which depends on the means that the, the, the reactions are initiated and the process conditions. So what I mean is that, that the reactions can be um, initiated by, by pressure, um, whether it's atmospheric pressure, low pressure CVD or ultra high vacuum CVD. Um, it can be a, a physical characteristic of the vapor itself, like aer aerosol assisted CVD or direct liquid injection CVD, or you apply a reaction energy, um, whether it be in plasma, whether it's been uh, in the form of PCVD and ISP CVD, which we're gonna go into a bit more detail during this talk, but also there's microwave plasma, ALD, um, hot wire, metal organic, um, rapid thermal CVD and vapor phase uh, epitaxy. But we're going to concentrate on, on, on the use of plasma in particular uh, for PCVD and ICP CVD. Um, well, why use plasma in the first place? Well, plasma gives you the opportunity to do high temperature chemistry at low substrate temperature. And as you probably uh, are well known, that it's, it's known, uh, often known as the, the fourth state of matter. It's a, a plasma is an ionized gas uh, which uh, has charges uh, uh, which are displaying collective behavior where there's positive charges, negative charges, neutral photons, electric fields. Um, and the plasma electrons and ions move in response to an applied voltage. Um, so whether that's in a, um, in a gigahertz range frequency uh, where ions do feel uh, do not feel some of the AC fields above one megahertz. Um, so for example, at 13.56, which is typically the frequency used in PCVD, the electrons respond, but the ions do not. Um, and then we also use the low frequency, which is in the kilohertz, where the ions gains energy and you get some more ion bombardment, uh, depending on where the, the RF is applied to the, the, the actual uh, design of the, the reactor itself. Um, the plasma contains equal numbers of positive and negative charges. Um, but also at the same time, the ionized excited particles are, are continuously being created and, lo and, and, and lost within the chamber itself. The ions are mainly diffused, uh, diffused to the walls. Um, and it's the balance or the ion density is then defined by the balance between the ion power and the ion wall loss. Um, also power goes to heating the electrons, um, which leads to the ability to ionize. Um, but as with all plasmas, 
you need a, a, an energy supply um, or the plasma will just distinguish uh, and, and go out. So you need to be able to create more than you lose to sustain a, a self-disdained discharge. Um, and it takes around about 100 EV to produce an iron in a typical low pressure plasma accounting for, for losses uh, due to collisions or inefficient energy charges. Um, within the plasma techniques in, in deposition in particular, but also in etching, there are three main sort of top level techniques that, that, that are used. One, which is a symmetric RF um, radio frequency technique, which is typically used for plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition, PCVD, where there's equal area electrodes, um, where typically the upper electrode is connected to a, a, an RF supply and the bottom electrode, which is usually um, the, the heated electrode, which is grounded where the, normally the substrate sits. Uh, and that, um, that results in low ion impact energy on the substrate surface. Then you have the asymmetric RF, which, which is typically used in more etching um, processes where it's mostly used for reactive ion etch, RIE, where there's an ine uh, unequal area electrodes where the substrate is powered on, on the electrode, the bottom, where this, where typically where the substrate sits, um, and that uh, generates higher ion energy to the small electrode. Um, you can use this technique for uh, to deposit materials such as diamond-like diamond carbon, for example, where it's predominantly very ion bombardment, uh, um, sort of in order to, to result in very high quality TLC layers. And then finally, you have the high density plasma source, which Katie uh, briefly explained for the etching, but also can be used for deposition where this is based on a high density plasma source, which controls the plasma density, the substrate um, can be set, set on a powered electrode. So you can have the, the dual um, mode of uh, being able to control the, the plasma density in the IC, uh, the high density plasma source or the, the electrode um, where the substrate is sitting. And these are usually lower pressures, which requires larger pumps to be able to, to, to maintain the low pressures within the, the direction chamber. Um, so in deposition, there are, as I, as I mentioned, there are several uh, techniques um, and sometimes it's very difficult to decide which techniques, technique is optimum for what film you, uh, you want to deposit. So basically it depends on several factors, whether it be in the actual, the film requirement itself, what the material of the film needs to be, what the thickness, what the film quality needs to be. It, it, it may react, uh, depend on the actual device itself, whether there's a temperature limit, whether there's a, a, a very sensitive su uh, surfaces where uh, you don't want to introduce any plasma damage, for example. Um, device, device size, where it's depending on the, whether it's wafer scale and what size of the wafers, uh, wafers they are. Um, and usually there are typical requirements from a deposition point of view where it's needs to be uniform over the device. It needs to be reproducible, st stable, um, and the repeatability of the process. And then, then obviously the, the ability to control some of the aspects of the film itself, whether it's being film structure, the composition, the density of the film. And, and ultimately you want a clean process where you don't have any particles from the chamber, no pinholes within, within the film itself. And also finally, the method or the techniques needs to be safe, reproducible, um, automated if, if, if it needs to be, and, and, and in, in a lot of cases, as cheap as possible. Now, the table on the right-hand side here shows various techniques ranging between ALD, CVD, PVD, and typically some of the um, film properties um, that, that that's required for, for many of these um, uses for, for these thin film deposition. Um, as you can see, some of these techniques are good, are better than um, better than others in some of these properties and some and vice versa. So it, it depends on a lot of factors in terms of deciding which technique to use in order to be able to de deposit the film that you need for your device. Obviously I've highlighted the, the two 
CVD processes, uh, techniques here, PCVD and ICP-CVD, which we'll go into a bit more detail in the next few slides. So you might ask yourself, uh, why have PCVD and ICP-CVD in the fact that both are plasma deposition techniques and both can deposit um, very similar uh, materials? And I'll go into in detail in this in terms of such as dielectrics such as silicon oxide and silicon nitride. PCVD is known to be done via a parallel plate capacitive coupling, also known as CCP, where the ICP CVD is based on the high density plasma source or a remote inductive coupling um, source or an ICP, as Katie described for the etching. But the question still you ask, to ask yourself is why have both? Um, so mainly it's around the film quality. Um, so in PCVD, which has been traditionally the, the, the mode of CVD, plasma CVD uh, process for, for many, many years. But the problem with PCVD films is that as you go to lower temperatures, the film deteriorates or gets worse in whether it's density, whether it's the electrical performance of the film, um, whether that's, that means breakdown voltage or high leakage current. Um, as I mentioned, density, um, that it, it results in higher wet etch rates. The film is softer, uh, more por porous, and also can lead to poor adhesion of the film to the underlying substrate. So ICP CVD can help to overcome these issues when going to especially low temperatures where PCVD shows these, these, um, these issues. So PCVD, as I mentioned, is based on a capacitive coupling uh, arrangement. The substrate is part of the plasma generation region. Uh, usually in our tools, the distance between the upper electrode, which is uh, RF live to the ground electrode is around 20 millimeter. Um, you have higher iron energies for a given plasma density. And because of the, uh, the distance or the how close the substrate is to the, the, the RF live part, that there's potential for plasma damage, especially when you use lower frequency where there's uh, uh, more iron bombardment towards the surface. In ICP CVD, on the other hand, is based on a, a remote inductive coupling, um, an ICP, where the substrate is, is more remote uh, from the plasma generation region, where the plasma is generated in this upper ICP, source where the substrate sits on the on the electrode at the bottom um, and results in very lower or lower iron energy possible at the substrate but still you can maintain high plasma density in the actual source itself which leads to sort of high density films without inducing more damage to the actual surface itself so in pcvd as i mentioned this is a technique that's been around for many many years um, it's is based on, a, on a, a parallel plate design where the upper electrode is, is connected to two, uh, two RF um, sources, one uh, with a frequency of 13.56 megahertz, and usually the other one is for at, at the kilohertz range. This allows you to do some uh, process optimization, especially for stress control and film densification. In our chambers, Obviously, the, the substrate is, uh, sits on the, the lower electrode, which is grounded. Um, and also the, the upper electrode, uh, although it's, it's connected to the RF um, live, um, it's got a gas inlet assembly and a shower head assembly, which allows you very uniform gas distribution within the chamber itself. Um, the RF uh, sources is connected to a, a specifically designed automatch unit, which delivers fast, accurate matching, enabling excellent process repeatability. Um, also, we've got additional uh, uh, ports on the chamber in order to be able to fit and install um, optical emission spectroscopy uh, OES for typically for plasma cleaning. I'll, I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about that later. So in PCVD, range of temperatures, anything, we've got high temperature up to 650 degrees. Typical temperatures for PCVD is around 300 or between 250 to 350 degrees. Typical processes um, mostly are silicon based materials such as silicon oxide, silicon nitride, oxynitride, amorphous silicon, silicon carbide. But we can also do uh, non silicon uh, materials, which is such as aluminium oxide and titanium oxide. 
in PCVD. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you some of these trends um, in terms of stress control, whether it's combining the high frequency and low frequency. Typical process ranges in PCVD is relatively high compared to ICPCVD. It's, it's hundreds of millitor, uh, in fact, up to about three tor. Power ranges, anything between 20 watts to 1,000 watts, uh, especially on the 13.56 megahertz generator. And this allows you to have deposition rates in PCVD ranging from five to 10 nanometers a minute, right up to more than a micron a minute on some materials. In ICPCVD, uh, this is based on the high density plasma source, the ICP source itself. Um, and there's separate generators, one which is connected to the ICP and one which is in the, 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 the actual electrode itself. And you can have then the, the situation where you can control the ion energy and ion density based on, the, on uh, the combination of these two power sources or plasma sources. Um, it has a high conductance pumping to allow the lower pressures for ICP CVD. Um, and also, as I mentioned, um, ICP CVD has, has advantages going to low temperatures. So there are clamping options in order to, uh, to be able to deposit films even as low as room temperature. Um, the gases, um, we don't have a, a shower head in the same way as the PCVD, as the gases comes in either through the ICP source or some com comes into a specially designed gas ring which sits closer to the, the actual table and the substrate to allow greater control of the gas and also the, the, the deposition rates of the process. As I mentioned, in ICP CVD, we can deposit as low as 20 degrees, but we can also do high temperatures as well. Typical temperatures, anything 150 degrees or below. Um, the range of materials are very similar to the PCVD, which are mostly silicon based, but we can also do non silicon based, such as aluminum oxide and titanium dioxide. Again, we have several modes of, of controlling the film properties, such as stress control methods. And as I mentioned, compared to PCVD, ICPCVD differs in the fact that it's a much lower pressure process. Um, it's in the uh, between two and 30 millitor, where PCVD, for example, were in the tall range and the power ranges on the ICP power ranges between 150 watts to two kilowatts, which allows you to have good control in deposition rates anything between five to 10 nanometers a minute up to 150 nanometers a minute. Um, as Katie mentioned, in our both PCVD and ICP CVD chambers, they can be combined with single wafer load lock uh, systems, uh, which is based on our Plasma Pro 100 uh, configuration, which is the one on the left-hand side. But also these chambers can be clustered um, or on a, on a cassette load lock system um, where you, you have a central uh, robot um, and a cassette where you have then the option of, of doing multiple wafers uh, in a cassette. Um, and usually these are directed towards production oriented customers um, rather than research. Okay, so I'll go on now and, and and describe a few of the key um, materials that we deposit in PCVD and ICPCVD. One of the, uh, the most common is, is silicon nitride. Um, and this can be done in PCVD and ICPCVD. In PCVD, um, it uses the silane gas as the source of the silicon, ammonia um, and nitrogen. We can also do a silane and nitrogen process uh, without the ammonia, which gives the ability to, to do uh, higher quality films. Um, and as you can see, we, we have a range of, of standard uh, processes uh, from high density, high quality films to lower rates, um, to much higher deposition rates, um, which, which allows you to do multiple um, thickness ranges uh, in a reasonable time based on the quality and the device requirements that you have. Um, in all of these, um, we have multiple methods of to, to control the stress, 
to control the refractive index um, of the film and also the, the quality and the density of the film. Typical results on the silicon nitride via PCVD is uh, film thickness uniformity of less than plus or minus 2% um, over 150 millimeter wafer. We have the ability to control the refractive index by the, the, by the ratio of the silane to the, the nitrogen source, um, um, which results in the higher the, the silane flow, the, the higher the, the silicon content in the film, which results in a higher RI of the film or the refractive index of the film. You can also control the index by using the, the high frequency power. Um, and as you increase the power, you see a decrease in refractive index. In terms of the stress control, um, as I mentioned in PCVD, you have the ability to, to switch between a high frequency uh, power uh, in the 13.56 megahertz range um, and the low frequency, which is in the, in the kilohertz. If you do a process in the, in the, using the high frequency, you typically get a tensile silicon nitride film. If you do a, a process using the low frequency, you typically get a more compressive stressed film. Then you can combine both in a, um, a switchable process, in a pulse process, uh, where you can control the stress from anything from compressive right through to, through to tensile. If for some reason you don't have a low frequency generator fitted on the system, there is also ability to control the stress by adding helium or argon to the process. And as you can see, you can start from a, depending on the helium to nitrogen ratio, you can control the stress from, from tensile right through to compressive. And then if you are interested in just the tensile range, you can, you can control the silane to ammonia ratio in order to be able to control the stress um, from very low tensile stress to very high tensile stress. However, the, by adjusting the silane to ammonia, you do change the refractive index um, by changing the, the gas flow ratio. Right. So. Also, one of the key film properties of, of any film is the film quality um, or the density of the film. So we measured that indirectly by, by, by testing the wet etch rate of the film or how resistant the film is to etching and also um, the electrical characteristics of the film, whether it's breakdown voltage and leakage current. In wet etch, in wet etch rates, you typically use either buffered HF or potassium hydroxide. Uh, to me measure the wet etch rates. And usually you see a trend in terms of the higher the deposition temperature, the lower the wet etch rates, which indicates a higher density film. Um, also, you see an effect of the deposition rate where you, um, as, as, as you go to lower deposition rates, the, the wet etch rates decreases, indicating a higher quality, higher density film. In terms of breakdown voltages, you would expect to see anything in the range of seven megavolts per centimeter when you deposit a, a PCVD silicon nitride at 300, 350 degrees. In terms of step coverage and the conformality of the PCVD silicon nitride in, a, in a, an open feature, um, in a single step, you expect to, to achieve more than 90%, which is measured by the the amount of material on the sidewall compared to the amount of material or the film that you have on the top of the step and at the bottom. Um, and as your aspect ratio or your trench um, uh, in, uh, increases, um, if you have an aspect ratio of one to one, you expect to see a slightly lower uh, step coverage percentage. And as you, you increase the aspect ratio even further to, to two to one, for example, you would expect the step coverage to be in the region of 50 to 70 percent. Right, so that's PCVD. If we move on to ICP CVD silicon nitride, again, with, with uh, ICP CVD, we have the ability to deposit silicon nitride. The main advantage is that we can, we can deposit right down to low, lower temperatures and down to 20 degrees. Typically, the process uses silane with with nitrogen uh, to give us the best possible film quality at especially low temperature, which results in a much lower hydrogen content of the film. Uh, in a similar way to PCVD, we have the ability to, 
to carry out stress control of the film and control the refractive index of the film. Um, the, the parameters are very similar to PCVD in terms of controlling the, the refractive index. You can either do it by the si silane to nitrogen ratio, um, the pressure, or, or in fact, the ICP power. In terms of the film stress, again, that can be controlled by the, by the silane to nitrogen ratio. Um, the pressure, as you can see on the right-hand side, as you increase the pressure, the film becomes um, from, can control the film from compressive right through to tensile. And also you can reduce the, the overall stress by reducing the ICP power. Um, in terms of the film quality, and, and if you measure the wet etch rates of ICP CVD silicon nitride compared to PCVD, this is where you see a marked difference or the advantages of ICP CVD versus PCVD. So as you can see, ICP CVD follows the similar trends to PCVD in terms of the, the lower the temperature, uh, the slightly higher the wet etch rates, the, the lower density. However, if you compare ICP CVD and PCVD, you can achieve wet etch rates um, at uh, 100 degrees or below in ICP CVD, which is similar to PCVD at 300, 350 degrees. Um, so you, you can see these wet etch rates here is equivalent to the PCVD etch rates at 300 degrees, which indicates you can then deposit um, a film with ICP CVD at much lower temperatures and maintain very high quality, high density film. You can also see a, a similar trend on the breakdown voltage of the silicon nitride film, where at low temperatures, um, you get typically three to four megavolts per centimeter ISP CVD. And, and even at 150 degrees, you're up to seven megavolts per centimeter compared to PCVD, which is five or six, even at 300, 350 degrees. So you see a similar trend in terms of ICP CVD compared to PCVD at lower temperatures. One of the reasons this is, is the fact that when you measure the hydrogen content on ICP CVD silicon nitride, even at, at room temperature, typically the hydrogen content is around 3%, which is much, much lower than the equivalent PCVD silicon nitride, which is typically around 10 to 15%, which indicates that the film is more pure um, and less, less hydrogen within the film. This allows ICP CVD to be deposited on passive devices at, at lo very low temperatures, um, maintaining film quality and breakdown voltage in the region of four megavolts per centimeter. Also, the step coverage is, um, is very good in the fact that you can reduce, by the virtue of the fact that the film is higher quality with, with a higher electric, uh, dielectric strength, you can reduce the, the overall film thickness and even with five nanometers of silicon nitride is successfully covering a sort of 150 nanometer metal step without additional leakage. Another, another common film that we do with PCVD and ICPCVD is silicon oxide. Um, and if we do, a, uh, if you look at PCVD silicon oxide first, again, similar to the silicon nitride, we have a range of processes ranging from low rate to, to much higher rates, even up to a micron a minute or greater than a micron a minute. Um, with PCVD, we use silane and nitrous oxide as the, 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 the reaction gases. Um, and by using these, we can have, um, it produces excellent um, film properties such as um, films with low buffer edge, uh, wet edge rates. We have the ability to, to control the refractive index and also we have in PCVD the ability to, to dope the films with either phosphorus or, or, or boron. And also we do have the ability to, to, to change the reactants from silane to, to what is known as TIOS. And I'll go into TIOS deposition a little bit later. Uh, typical film thickness uniformities are in the region of less than plus or minus 3% over 200 millimeter with even a small edge exclusion, typically five mil edge exclusion. And as I mentioned, um, in a similar way to the silicon nitride, refractive index control uh, can be done by the adjustment of the, the gas flow ratio of the, the source of the oxygen, which is N2O, and the source of the silicon, which is silane. 
Um, as you increase the, the oxygen content, uh, the refractive index decreases or vice versa. If you increase the proportion of silicon in the film, the refractive index increases. And also that you can have um, secondary effects of, of tuning the process by, by the effect of high, uh, using or lowering the, the high frequency power and the pressure. Um, also, in, if you are um, depositing films for waveguides, you can add some doping to the film to have real precise and accurate control of the, the refractive index. So you can do that by adding germanium um, in a germanium doped silicon oxide as part of the, uh, the waveguide itself. Or you can add nitrogen, um, which forms um, a, a more of a silicon oxynitride film, but you can control the refractive index to three, four decimal places by adding these dopant uh, doping inside the, the silicon oxide structure. As I mentioned, silicon oxide uh, is predominantly compressive in film stress. Um, you can reduce the compressive nature of the, of the oxide by reducing the, uh, the power, but also you can adjust the, the silent to, to nitrous oxide ratio um, to, to lower the stress. But the the effect is that you have a much more silicon rich film with a higher refractive index um, with, um, a, with a lower film stress. Again, with silicon oxide, similar to silicon nitride, a typical trend is the higher the temperature, the lower the wet etch rates, um, the higher the quality, the density of the film. Um, and typically for breakdown voltage, we can achieve around about seven megavolts per centimeter when a PCVD silicon oxide uh, film is deposited at 300, 350 degrees. As I mentioned, we can dope the silicon oxide um, predominantly for waveguides um, application where you can add boron or phosphorus um, to the film, which allows you then to, 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 to be able to reflow the film at higher temperatures uh, and obviously uh, gives you additional benefit in such as gap filling um, and surface planarization. And the contr by controlling the levels of boron and phosphorus um, in the film results in, in how you, or the ability to reflow at various temperatures. So, so basically as deposited, as you can see on the left hand, you, you get a void. Um, as you anneal the, the, the film, uh, you can flow the film, which can then successfully gap fill between the structures and also improve the surface planarization um, of, of the actual coverage of the film itself. Step coverage, very similar to silicon nitride PCVD in an open feature, we get around 85-90% uh, in a trench of uh, with an aspect ratio of one to one. We get anything between 50 and 75%. And as you increase the aspect ratio uh, to two, two, two to one, you get a, a decrease in coverage around 30 to 50%. In ICP silicon oxide, um, we typically use silane again as the source of the silicon, but we, instead of using N2O, we can use oxygen. Uh, the reason we can do that is because the silane oxygen um, is introduced into the chamber in two different ports, where in PCVD, the, the nitrous oxide and the silane is mixed um, before they enter the chamber. Um, and obviously, silane reacts, uh, uh, reacts violently with oxygen at certain pressures. So in PCVD, um, we try and avoid oxygen, but in ICP-CVD, because the fact that we're running uh, low pressures um, during the process, and also the fact that the, the delivery of the silane and oxygen is in the chamber in two different ports, we can deposit um, silicon oxide with silane and oxygen. This allows you to have even higher quality films um, with the ability to, to to have stress control of the film, refractive index control, and also in the same way to deposit at much lower temperatures down to 20 degrees. Typical film thickness uniformities is around plus or minus 2% over 100 millimeter and plus or minus 3% over 150 millimeter wafer size. 
As I mentioned, refractive index can be controlled by the gas flow ratios, the pressure, and the ICP power. Film stress um, can be controlled by, again, the pressure, the ICP power, and the combination of the silent to oxygen ratio. Again, similar to the silicon nitride, when you look and compare ICP CVD to PCVD, this is where you see a, 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 an imp, uh, the advantage of using ICP CVD in particular at lower temperatures. You can see at ICP CVD at 150 degrees gives you wet edge rates less than 160, 150 nanometers a minute, which is equivalent to PCVD at 400 degrees. So you can see in terms of wet edge rates, the benefit of ICP CVD even at low temperatures. Also, ICP CVD can be deposited at higher temperatures. So you can deposit at 300, 400 degrees, which is equivalent to PCVD at 600, 700 degrees deposition temperature. Similar, similar observation can be seen with the electrical characteristics of the film in terms of the silicon oxide breakdown voltage of more than eight megavolts per centimeter, 120 degrees, whereas the equivalent PCVD uh, is around six megavolts per centimeter or six to seven megavolts per centimeter at 300, 350 degrees. So again, shows the advantage of ICP CVD even at lower temperatures. Um, in addition to um, uh, the, the quality of the film, we can also deposit ICP CVD silicon oxide with higher deposition rates um, in the region of 100, 150 nanometers a minute whilst maintaining very good wet edge rates of the film, less than 100 nanometers a minute when deposited at 85 degrees, and also the breakdown voltage of greater than six megavolts per centimeter when deposited at 150 degrees. Also in our, in our systems at Oxford, um, the wafer to wafer repeatability is excellent in terms of less than plus or minus 2% in terms of film thickness repeatability, and the refractive index is even better in, in terms of 0 0.005% uh, variability. Um, in terms of refractive index repeatability. In addition, with uh, for silicon oxide, as I mentioned before, we can use ICP power and also RF power. Um, and when we combine that for silicon oxide, we can use it for our advantage in terms of gap filling. Um, and we use it in such a way that we use silane, oxygen, and we add argon in a simultaneous process where it etches and, and deposits at the same time. So when you have problems um, gap filling with conventional PCVD or ICPCVD without the RF power and the argon, typically the deposition um, meets at the top of the structure, uh, which is known as bread loafing and creates voids in the actual trench itself. What this allows you is to prevent that um, the, the material at the top um, closing the, the trench up and, and avoid the, the, the voiding happening in, in the gap filling. So you'd be able to fill the gap before that happens, which as you can see on the right hand side, a fully uh, filled gap um, with no voids in, a, in an aspect ratio structure of typically two, two, two to one or three to one. Okay, so we can also do various other materials in either PCVD and ICP, uh, ICP CVD, um, but this requires an additional hardware, which is known as a vapor delivery module. Um, the vapor delivery module is a cabinet. Uh, hello. Sit hello. Uh, hi, Mr. Thomas. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. So we are running late, so can you okay. do a little bit fast? Okay, okay. I've got five minutes left and, and it should be fine. So uh, in... Okay. In vapor delivery module, um, we have the ability to handle liquids, um, uh, whether it's bubbling or uh, in high vapor pressure liquids where you can control it by a, a specialized MFC. This allows you to deposit films such as silicon oxide using TIOS, which is a liquid at room temperature. And by optimizing the process, you can get even better step coverage with higher aspirate ratio structures. Also, you can deposit materials such as aluminum oxide, which is uses, uses TMA or trimethyl aluminum in combination with oxygen and gives you very, very good quality aluminum oxide film within the ICP CVD chamber. 
Another film we can do is titanium oxide using TTIP, which is a combination of TTIP and oxygen in order to deposit a titanium dioxide film with very good film quality um, with the ability to control the stress and the refractive index. As I mentioned at the, at the start, half, obviously, the, the reaction chamber is designed to do deposition, but also the deposition goes everywhere within the chamber. Um, so we have to um, introduce plasma cleaning in order to maintain the uptime of the chamber and, and result in very good repeatability and stability of the chamber. So we use fluorine in the form of either CF4 or C3 of 8 in PCVD in combination with oxygen or nitrous oxide to, to etch the silicon based materials. And in ICPCVD, we use either SF6 and CF4 with either oxygen or nitrous oxide. And we use an optical emission spectroscopy in the form of a, um, an OES um, to monitor the 704 nanometer wavelength. And you get a trace typically uh, similar to this trace on the right hand side where you have a rising endpoint which indicates the, the clean or the, the fluorine is attacking the silicon. Um, and when it reaches the maximum, meaning that the, all the fluorine has attacked all the silicon in the chamber, and then that reaches the end point. And it, this is then becomes, the, um, at this moment in time, this is over etching the chamber. So all the fluorine has etched all the silicon away and is, is, is etching some of the, um, the chamber. Now, obviously by having an end point, um, to monitor the clean allows you to prevent too much of this over etching of the, of the chamber furniture and maintains good uptime of the tool and low particle generation uh, coming from potentially from the deposition itself. So in quickly in summary, PCVD is a well characterized technique which has been around for many, many years. It, it can be used for deposit very uh, several thin film materials typically in the range of 150 to 400 degrees. ICP CVD, however, can produce even higher density films, uh, specifically at lower temperatures. And ICP CVD will give good film qualities at much lower temperatures than, than the equivalent PCVD. And ICP CVD results in, in lower damage processes for devices requiring isolation, passivation, and planarization. Thank you very much. Um, Any questions? Uh, thank you, Dr. Thomas, for excellent talk on the deposition process, especially PCVD and IPCVD. Now we move to the QA sessions. We have a couple of questions here. So coming to the first question, so how do you figure out uniform film without the pinhole effect into the film that decreases the quality of film? Second question in attaches, how to play with gas and other parameters to get precise stoichiometric film like SI3 and 4? Generally, when you go for deposition, it gives deviation from a stoichiometric value. Right. So the first question, how do you figure out uniform film without pinholes effects into films that decrease film quality? Um, right. So one of the tests to, to figure out pinholes is you, it's very difficult to measure pinholes. Um, one of the methods that you can be used is to do a partial wet etch of the film, which indicates, um, so you partially etch the film um, and by partially etching the film, you can see what's in the film or what's, um, what's been sort of, um, as, the, as the film is deposited, if you have pinholes in the film, it will appear as um, porous or um, dots or holes in the film. If you have a continuous um, film with no pinholes, when you partially etch the film, the film should be continuous with no disruption of the film structure at all. Um, in terms of the film quality, as I mentioned, as you wet etch, wet etch the film, if you've got pinholes, what happens is that wet etch rates will, the, the, the buffered HF or the KOH will attack the holes and you will etch the film much, much more quickly. So it indicates um, a very porous film, which potentially could be the porosity of the film. It could be the fact that you have a lot of particles or pinholes in the film, which causes the the film just to, to etch away very, very quickly. If the film um, is very resist resistant to, to the etching and, and it doesn't have any pinholes, then the etch rate would, will be much, much slower in terms of etching through that film. 
Um, so how to play how to play with gas and other parameters to precisely study stoichiometry film. So basically, the main criteria in terms of getting a stoichiometry um, silicon nitride film, depending on the target refractive index, is is first play around with the 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 gas flow ratios. Those are the dominant um, or the primary sort of parameters to change and optimize in order to get the the target refractive index. Now. Typically for silicon nitride, um, you aim for sort of uh, refractive index in the region of 2.0. So to have the, the balance between the silicon source, which is normally silane, and the, the source of the nitrogen, whether it's nitrogen itself or in combination with ammonia, to get the balance between those two parameters. Now, the trick in, in any other plasma CVD reactor is that any parameters can change any given film properties. So you have to balance out the gas flow ratios with the power that you use, the pressure that you use at the temperature that you use. So it's, it's an optimization of all of those parameters in order to get the desired film properties. Uh, okay, hope this answered. And the next question is, uh, LPCVD is more superior in comparison to BCVD and ICPCVD for dielectric material deposition. What is your thought? Right, so yes, in, because LPCVD um, requires much higher temperatures. So you're, you're running temperatures in 800, 900, 1000 degrees for LPCVD. However, in, in some applications, the, the thermal budget cannot, or the, the substrate itself cannot tolerate those kind of higher temperatures. So there's a, no, there's a need for alternative methods to deposit dielectric films at that point, um, whether it's PCVD, which has been around for many, many years, or where it's ICP CVD, where you can even drive to lower temperatures and maintaining um, very high density film. Now, what we've also done in Oxford is, is doing ICP CVD at slightly higher temperatures, which we can show that it, it also um, results in LP CVD quality films at much lower temperatures than LP CVD. So, so it's all about the thermal budget of the, the device, for example, in order to be able to, um, whether it's LPCVD or whether it's PCVD or ICPCVD. Okay. Uh, next question is for 2D materials, how does Oxford Flex L 2D ALD compare to Plasma Pro 100 Nano CVD system, especially for TMDC? Right, so we do have an offer and a product for 2D materials, specifically for uh, tungsten disulfide and uh, molybdenum disulfide. Um, the product is, is, is typically surrounded around a, um, a PCVD or an ICP uh, reactor, but with a, a high temperature electrode, which can go up to 1200 degrees. In, in the moly disulfide and tungsten disulfide, we typically use a chloride as the form of the either tungsten chloride or molybdenum chloride. Uh, and these are introduced using the vapor delivery module, um, as I described in the presentation. We combine that with hydrogen sulfide in the reaction um, and also at typically temperatures up to 800 degrees. Um, and we have several papers already published on tungsten disulfide and some on moly disulfide in our um, in our systems. Okay. The, the system yeah. can also do graphene because it's got the ability to do um, up to temperatures of 1200 and you can combine those in a uh, and also we can do uh, hexagonal boronitride where you can combine those in a heterostructures in multi layers of, of whether it's sulfides hexagonal boronitride and graphene all in one chamber. Okay. And moving to the last question. So for growing heterostructure of 2D material, does Oxford instrument have a PCVD process solution? And uh, has it been tried by you or any user? For instance, I want to grow monolayer WS2 on top of monolayer MOS2 and SiO2. Yes. The question, is, uh, the answer is yes. And I, as I mentioned, we have a, that the nano CVD system is capable, um, depending on the configuration, to be able to do multi-layers, um, whether it's 
monolayers and multilayers of whether it's tungsten disulfide, moly disulfide, as I as I described in terms of you can use. Typically, we've we've proven it using the chloride as the precursors for the source of the tungsten on the moly, um, and combine that with hydrogen sulfide. But we can also have we have got customers use the carbon oils as well in terms of the moly. Uh, carbon oil and the tungsten carbon oil in terms of reaction with H2S in order to do multi layers or uh, monolayers and heterostructures in terms of um, switching between processes as well. Okay. So, one question is like more toward career. So, what is your view or opinion toward making career in industry instead of academia? So, sorry. Uh, career. So course, Korean. Yeah. Ah, okay, right. Okay, um, right. So I, similar to Katie, I I did a PhD in surface chemistry at Cardiff University. Um, this was uh, nothing to do with semiconductors. It was more to do with um, surface chemistries and reaction of various gases at different surfaces um, for gas um, cylinder company such as Air Products, and I was sponsored by Air Products at the time. Um, once I finished the PhD, um, obviously I kept my options open, and I think that Katie mentioned the fact that you you, you need to keep your options open um, unless you have a, a very focused area that you want to work in. Um, and also, I wanted to to keep in 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 relation to some surface chemistry and science and physics and chemistry. Um, and then I started a. Um, applying for various jobs where um, I started off in a company called Tricon Technologies, which are now known as SPTS. Um, as a process engineer, I left uh, that company after about five years uh, to join Oxford in 2005. Um, and, and basically, I, I wanted to stay in the industry, although at the time it was very cyclic in terms of that the in semicon semiconductor industries is very boom and bust at that time. Um, I joined Oxford, which was a much more stable company in terms of uh, a much more interesting in terms of combining science and industrial partners. Um, and and obviously I like I like the the challenges in terms of the as I said the combining the academic side of things. Um, in terms of the research part and the development part of the processing, but also working with customers and delivering products and processes to customers to meet their requirements, to understand what they wanted. So it was a nice balance between the two at Oxford Instruments in order to be able to, to combine, obviously the process knowledge, but also the customer facing and customer requirements and to understand the customer needs. But okay. ad advice would be, Similar to, to Katie, keep keep options open, um, um, and and obviously um, go into areas that you enjoy doing. Uh, I think that that helps hugely. Um, and if you want to keep in academia, that's fine. You can do postdocs and etc. But if you want to jump then to 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 go into industry, there are companies which are like Oxford Instruments, which can combine um, the the academic side and the and the industrial side in in at the same time um because there are other if you go to the other extreme where you you join the bigger semiconductor industry companies which are much more industrialized um and you can be in the the front line in terms of the production uh, side of things um which is less about developing processes and the more academic it's more about productionizing the process whether that the process has been fully developed. It's all about getting the process into production uh, at various customers. So that there's two two areas in that where some some prefer stay in the combination of academia and industry, but some like the the challenges in terms of making processes more robust and more production worthy. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, so I think no more question in queue box. So now it's about to end the session. So let's thank uh, both the speaker, Dr. Thomas and Dr. Katie, for a wonderful talk on 
deposition process and the etching process for the device fabrications. And uh, it's also thanks uh, uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar for supporting to making this event successful. And now also thanks to the all attendees to, for joining the talk today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thomas and Katie to joining us and making the event successful. Okay, thanks very much for, for the time today. And um, Great, thank you. Have a, have thank a nice you. weekend. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Have a nice Bye. day. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.